All right, uh, Brother Mike. Thank you. <laughs> I love your prayers. Uh, loving and faithful Father, we just thank you for another wonderful, powerful day of, of grace and all that's been given to us because of what your son did for us at Calvary. And we're so grateful to come here and open up your word and so thankful for Pastor Joel and for Lori and I thank Joel for his love for your word. Just preparedness of your word, the study of your word, and uh, just wanting to edify the saints, and most of all, to bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. How's everybody online? It's awesome to see you. Rick and Debs, John Snodgrass, Damon. I hope you're doing well. Uh, massive crowd. We've got about as many people online as we have here in person. Uh, uh, so this week, um, you know, we've got Easter coming up on Sunday and a Resurrection Sunday, I should say. Although I think it's okay to say Easter now because of Brian. And um, the uh, this is Passion Week, his the Lord's final week on earth. And uh, we've been uh, on the podcast, we've been looking at some of the events of Passion Week. I've also... Uh, just uh, been re revisiting Baker's book, Understanding the Gospels, which is one of my favorite books. And I'm going to quote him a couple of times tonight. He made a, a point about Passion Week I thought was interesting. He said, the importance of Passion Week can be gauged by the space given to it by all the gospel writers. So Matthew devotes seven chapters or 25% of his book, to Passion Week. Mark devotes five chapters, which is actually 31%. Luke, about four and a half chapters, or 19%. And John. John dedicates eight chapters to Passion Week, which is 40% of his book. Baker would write that it has been estimated that if the entire life of Jesus were written with the same detailed coverage given to Passion Week, it would fill about 80 volumes the size of the Bible. <laughs> there can be no doubt but that the Word, God in His Word, has placed the greatest emphasis upon the vicarious death of His Son. Just amazing. Amazing stuff. And Passion Week, of course, began on Sunday with the Lord's triumphal entry. He he, which to me is still amazing. Uh, not just how that played out, but just the fact that as soon as he sees Jerusalem, he weeps, and he doesn't weep for joy. He weeps over the tragedy of the abomination of desolation, and he makes the point that. The city will be in ruins. Even the children, the people are going to be slaughtered. Even the children in Luke 19. And none of this would happen if they had simply accepted him as their Messiah in his first visitation with them. I mean, he's entering Jerusalem as their king, and he's already weeping about the abomination of desolation. I find that moment just, just jaw-dropping. Then he enters the temple. He flips over the tables of all the money changers and the people selling goods, and he tells them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame come to him, and he heals them all. And the children see this, and they begin singing Hosanna to the son of David which I find amazing. It was obvious to the children who he was. And they were already singing praises to him. And of course, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes, they were none too happy about that. <laughs> and they say to Jesus, basically, don't you hear what these children are saying about you? And the Lord tells them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. 
<laughs> and so then the next morning he he curses the fig tree, which is another moment I love. I love the meaning of that moment. The fig tree, of course, is representative of Israel. The fig tree had leaves, but it had no fruit, which was kind of unusual. The leaves, of course, symbolized their religion, but there was no fruit. The Jews had their religion, but nothing else. No faith and no fruit. Now, I'm not sure what happens on what day, because it's, I, it's not clear in the gospel accounts. Uh, but I suspect that on Monday, we have the epic final showdown in the temple between the Lord and the leaders of Israel, the scribes, the, the lawyers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests. And they are, honestly, some of the most jaw-dropping exchanges of dialogue in the entire Bible. We were looking at a lot of that in the podcast the last couple of days. The Lord is just so... I mean, I, it's, it's going to sound cliche to say it, but he's just so brilliant in those circum, in those scenes. He shuts them all up, <laughs> and they all eventually concede, and they all determine, yeah, we're not going to ask him any more questions. <laughs> and then the Lord delivers this absolutely devastating message of eight woes upon the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. And he tells them, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Ooh. And then he weeps again about Jerusalem. And he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee? How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. And then he foretells the destruction of the temple. And then he leaves that temple never to return again. But I suspect that Tuesday would be an even longer and an even more unforgettable day for the disciples. I'd suggest he literally spends all afternoon in the Mount of Olives teaching his disciples about the end of the world and what's now famously called the Olivet Discourse. Tuesday evening, they go to the upper room. What happens there, I think, is just utterly gripping. He consecrates his last meal. He washes their feet. He identifies the betrayer. He tells Peter he'll deny him three times. Tuesday night after dinner, they walk to the Garden of Gethsemane. And John would actually spend three chapters chronicling everything the Lord said as they walked to the Garden. The, 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 the amount of volume of words that come out of the Lord is just stunning. You know, the Lord gives them the I am the true vine discourse in that walk. Of course, he says famously, greater, hath, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He talks about the hatred of the world, the work of the Spirit when they, when they get him. When the, when the Spirit is, it fills them at Pentecost, he talks about sorrow being turned to joy. And then he says, I have overcome the world. And then in John 17, one of my favorite chapters, the Lord gives the high priestly prayer, which never fails to take my breath away. In that he says, I have, he tells the Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And then in the garden, the Lord again prays repeatedly to his Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
the Lord is arrested. Over the course of that night, the Lord is passed between different judges until he's ultimately convicted by Pilate. He'll be on the cross by 9 a.m. Wednesday morning for six hours. He'll be in the tomb before sundown. Sundown is when Thursday would begin. So then you have three days, three nights. Sunday night, Thursday night, Thursday day, Friday night, Friday day, Saturday night, Saturday day. And so after sundown, Saturday, sometime after sundown and before sunrise, Sunday morning, the Lord arose from the grave. But tonight I thought we'd look at the upper room in John. Uh, be, for a number of reasons that I didn't have enough time to go through it on the podcast. There's, uh, it, is a, it is a phenomenal read, and there really is a lot of fascinating things to say about what happens in the, in the throne room. So the way they found the throne room, I thought, was really is – that in and of itself is fascinating. You know, remember that Jesus told the disciples that they would see a man carrying a pitcher of water. They were to follow him home and then ask him, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And the disciples did as he had instructed. This man showed them a large upper room. They made ready for supper. And one question I always had was, why did the Lord have the disciples find the upper room this way? Why did, why did he do it this way? Well, Baker in the book has said some had suggested, well, they pointed out the fact that by this point, Judas had already conspired with the chief priests. He had already taken those 30 pieces of silver to betray the Lord, and which the Lord knew. And so it's been suggested that by following this man with a pitcher of water, Judas would know in advance the address and be able to give that address to the chief priest because they wanted to arrest him when he was away from the crowds. The chief priest would have loved the chance to arrest him in that upper room, but Judas had no idea where the place was going to be until he was there, and then he had to go inside. <laughs> I think that's, that's amazing. And then the evening arrives. The new day begins for, for sundown, that new day being Wednesday. Uh, so this upper room event is technically early Wednesday. The Lord sits down at the table with his disciples. In Luke 22, he says, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He knew this was his last meal. And then when they eat, the Lord spake those famous words. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And also this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. This account is in all the Gospels except John. Interesting enough, John would talk about pretty much everything else except that moment. So when the Lord, so, so how about we just quickly, what did the Lord mean when he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins? I think I would just suggest, I think the Lord was just helping them to understand better the new covenant. They didn't know how he was going to take away sins. And now he's pointing out how his blood would be that foundation of the new covenant that had already been declared back in Je uh, Jeremiah 31. In other words, his blood would be the method by which he's going to fulfill all his testaments to Israel and take away their sins. The Lord wasn't making any new testaments in the upper room. He was just helping them, uh, illuminating the new covenant that had already been declared in Jeremiah. After this, in Luke 22, I, and I'm just guessing here, at some point we know that before in Luke, before the Lord tells Peter he's going to betray him, the disciples get into an argument about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. 
which <laughs> I just, I, you, you, honestly, these, you know, okay. And the Lord has to tell them, you know, among a number of things, he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he that is chief as he that doth serve. In other words, if you're going to be great, be the least, be the servant, be the greatest servant among among you. And it would just seem to me just to guess that it was likely that that kind of argument probably took place over dinner and would have preceded what we're about to read with Jesus washing their feet in John 13. John, after they get into the upper room, he goes straight to after dinner and the Lord washing their feet. So look at John 13. And we're going to start in verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now, real quick, notice the foreknowledge that John highlights here. He's going to do this often throughout this chapter and in 14, which speaks to the Lord's divinity. Now, his deity. Now, some would say, well, he knew he knew this because of the Holy Spirit, or he knew this because, you know, the Father had told him, yeah, the Lord operating as one with the Father and with the Spirit is all the evidence I think anybody needs of his deity. Of his deity. Now look at verse 2. John 13, 2. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Well, now how how well how about we ask this question? How is it that the devil persuaded the heart of Judas to betray the Lord? We're not told. God never spends time explaining how exactly Satan operates. We're to believe that Satan does operate in the world, and that we're to walk by faith in what God has told us. But one possibility is that the chief priests with whom Judas had already spoken may have been demon-possessed. Satan persuaded Judas through those chief priests. Look at verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he, ar- he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began washing the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. I'll never forget how, I don't know how long ago, preaching, uh, going over this story on a Sunday morning, weeping like a baby. It was awesome. And he said, if this doesn't blow your mind, you've got too big a fuse in your fuse box. (laughs) Verse 6, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. So hereafter means in time to come, sometime in the future. In other words, they'll understand and appreciate what he's doing now after he's gone. And again, this speaks to foreknowledge. He knew they would understand later. Look at verse 8. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Now this was not rebellion, but respect for his dignity. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. (laughs) Peter's not stupid. Verse 10, Jesus saith unto him, and look at this, He that is washed needeth not, save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now, I love this line. I love studying this line. The Lord here 
speaks of position versus practice. If you're justified, you're thoroughly clean in the sense that the Lord's righteousness has already been imputed to you, and you don't need to be washed again, which speaks to their eternal security. But there is the matter of their walk, practical righteousness in their walk, illustrated by the washing of feet, which is what the Lord helps everyone do through his word. So the washing of feet wasn't simply about humility and a servant's heart toward each other, although it was largely about that. But this was also about practical righteousness in their walk with the help of the Lord. And I liked what Baker had to say. He wrote, Jesus explained that when one had had a complete bath, he needed only to wash his feet. It must be remembered that the roads were dusty and often filthy and that people wore open sandals. A host always provided for washing the feet of his guests. It is evident from this incident that Jesus was not implying that Peter would lose his salvation if he didn't wash his feet, but that he could not have fellowship with him. He had given Peter a complete bath. He was clean through the word, so he was saved. But in order to come into Christ's presence and have fellowship with him, Peter had to keep his feet clean. <laughs> the believer's walk is in question here, he says. I like that. And then the Lord says, and ye are clean, but not all. Meaning they were all saved except Judas. That's what he means there. Verse 11. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Again, we have another subtle nod to the Lord's foreknowledge. Verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your master, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now here's, some, here's a question. Did you ever notice, you ever notice that you never read of the disciples watching, washing each other's feet after this? You'll never read about this ever again. And I would suggest that they didn't because they understood the deeper spiritual meaning of what the Lord was conveying here. This was, of course, very much about humility and having a servant's heart toward each other. But this was also about them helping each other maintain a righteous walk symbolized by the washing of the feet. And the result of living that way is true, deep, down to your soul happiness. And I suggest this is also this also foreshadows the deep satisfaction of experiencing his righteousness reigning over the earth in the kingdom and the joy of taking part in the rightness of his ways, not just knowing it, but doing it. And notice the Lord said, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Right? Knowing what his will is doesn't necessarily produce happiness, but doing his will absolutely produces happiness. We've made the point many times on the podcast, for example, knowing that God's knowing that God's will is, for example, that your speech be always with grace doesn't necessarily produce happiness, 
but doing it. Trying to master the art of speech all the way with grace will produce happiness. Speech all the way with grace is the happiest way a believer could possibly interact with others. Um, look at verse 18. The Lord's speaking, and he says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Again, he's quoting Psalms. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Now, back up in verse 18, the Lord is, uh, he's now steering the conversation toward the big reveal of the one who will betray him. Now, Baker makes the point that Judas was present and apparently had his feet washed too. But Christ made it plain that not all of his disciples had been bathed all over and were thus clean. He says it's difficult to imagine how the betrayer could have the gall to even meet with the Lord and the other disciples after he had already plotted and had been paid for the betrayal. But he had to keep watch for the most propitious opportunity to carry out his devilish scheme. And so he attended the supper as though nothing were amiss. But he had to be there also so that scripture might be fulfilled. For the psalmist had written, Psalm 41, 9, He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. And he also makes the point that the whole event of the foot washing is told only by John. And now you get to the part where now we've reached the point where he's going to reveal the betrayer. Look at verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another doubting of whom he spake. Now there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This is not Lazarus. <laughs> this is John, and it's not uncommon for an apostle to speak of himself in the third person in a writing in the, in the, in the Bible. Paul does the same thing, I think, in 2 Corinthians 12. They did that to avoid even the remote appearance of bragging. Uh, look at verse 24. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, according to Bollinger, a sop is a morsel, and it was apparently a mark of honor for the host to give a portion to one of the guests in this manner. And it's, it's brilliant to me how <laughs> the Lord took this custom that's usually viewed as an honor and turned it into this public exposing of a, the betrayer amongst his own disciples. It's unbelievable. Uh, verse 27, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now up to this moment, Judas had only been possessed by an evil thought. Now he is possessed by the evil one himself. So here's a question I've had pretty much all my life. Why did Satan do this? And I just suggest that this was in part logistics. <laughs> when he entered Judas, now this was not 
This would not be a loss of free will on Judas's part, but rather Judas would come under the strong influence of Satan. And Satan is determined to influence him so he'd make all the right decisions and there wouldn't be any screw-ups when it comes to arresting Jesus. Now, when Jesus said unto him that thou doest do quickly, was he talking to Judas or to Satan? Yes. <laughs> So what was it that Judas was about to do? He was about to collect a lot of tough guys to come and arrest Jesus. That's what he was going to go do. And this speaks to another reason why Satan possessed Judas. Satan would always know where Jesus is. Right? The, the, the demonic realm was always watching Jesus. They were always keeping Satan informed as to where he is and what he's doing. Thus, Judas would be able to lead these men to Jesus wherever he is. Doesn't matter where Jesus goes. Judas would always know where he is because Satan possessed him. His demonic realm kept him informed. I always wondered, how did Jesus... How did Judas know that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Because Satan told him. How did Satan know? Because his demons were keeping him well informed. That's how. Now here's another question. Why did the Lord tell Judas to do quickly what he was going to do? Fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus knew the hour he'd be arrested. He knew the hour he'd be convicted. He knew the hour that he'd be on the cross. And he knew he had to be in that tomb before Wednesday evening, before sundown on Wednesday. Time's a wasting. (laughs) You you, you better get moving if you're going to do what you're going to do. Look at verse um, verse 28. Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spoke this unto him. For some of them thought because Judas, Judas had the bag, he was the treasurer, that Jesus uh, had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Uh, He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Now, it wasn't just nighttime. It was also night in the sense that Judas had turned his back on the light of the world to snuff out that light, and in that process, he had also stepped out into eternal darkness. Baker would write that there is a lesson here in divine sovereignty and human responsibility. I really love this part. He said, It had been determined before the world began that the Son of Man should be betrayed. But Jesus said, It would have been good for that man had he never been born. God's foreknowledge of the betrayer in no wise made Judas any the less guilty. You like that thought? Is that okay? Uh, Look at verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. This is phenomenal line. Phenomenal line. Now that Judas had gone out to collect that big group of guys to arrest Jesus, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. In other words, it was a done deal. His sacrifice at Calvary is now an inevitability. Nothing is going to stop his arrest and crucifixion. He speaks of himself in the third person here also. He calls himself Son of Man. And you know, Son of God is God is descended, him as a descended from uh, the Father, and Son of Man is the expression of God as descended from Adam. And he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now he will obtain glory by accomplishing that which God had sent him into the world to accomplish. The last Adam will now resolve the sin issue that began with the first Adam. And then his Father will be glorified in him. 
Look at verse 32. This is also an astounding line. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. This, this too, I find just a breathtaking line. It says so much about the unending love and that humility between him and God the Father. If his Father will be glorified by his life and by his death, then he, the Lord, will find glory in his Father. If he glorifies his Father, his, his glory, his own glory, will be in his Father, not in himself. And, you know, in love, these, the Lord and God the Father humbly seek to glorify the other, never themselves. So the Son is, think, so the son is thinking, let the Father's glory be mine. And you have the Father up in heaven going, yeah, let the Son's glory be mine. They will, get their, they will find their own glory in the other one, not in themselves. I find that astounding. And then in verse 33, the Lord then speaks to the disciples. He says, uh, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Okay, so here's a simple question. How can a commandment to love one another be new? Because they were to love one another even as I have loved you. You know, the law told them that they were to love God with all their hearts and minds and souls. How is this love any different? Is this love greater than the love they were commanded to have for God? No. But he's now speaking of a sacrificial form of love. They're to love each other so much that they'd be willing to lay down their lives for each other. The law never dictated a love so great that they had to, that they would be willing to lay down their lives for one another. Now, he had shown them, and now the Lord had given them a new commandment based on his own love for the disciples. He had shown them his love by his life, and he's about to prove his love by his death. And how can you not think of John 15, 13? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John would also write in 1 John three sixteen that hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Oh, we're just getting started. We got Peter's denial here. Look at verse 36. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now, Baker would take this opportunity to talk about foreknowledge again, and I love what he wrote. There's a lot to be said about Peter's denial, but I love this, this uh, above all. He said, we have two things in the, uh, in the above worthy of note. The first is Christ's foreknowledge of an individual's actions. Christ knew absolutely what Peter was going to do before he did it. And in spite of Peter's strong protestations that he would never do such a thing. 
There are those who claim that God cannot have foreknowledge of acts of free wills because such free acts are uncertain. They say God can foreknow only that which He determines to happen, and what He determines is His responsibility and not man's. Well, if this be so, then God was responsible for Peter's denial, as He was also for Judas's betrayal, since He foreknew both of these events and therefore must have predetermined them to happen. But Scripture holds both of these men responsible for their acts. I love that. Uh, hold your place here and flip over to Luke 22. Luke 22. After the Lord told Peter he would deny him, Luke would give us another interesting moment in the upper room that you don't find anywhere else. Look at Luke 22, and then we're going to go down to verse uh, 35. 2235, and he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he, said he unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Now you have a fascinating change that took place here <laughs> in the the, the period of the Lord's earthly ministry. You know, Christians, we all know Christians love to cherry pick Matthew 10 and talk about going out with nothing but faith and trusting in your Father in heaven that He'll provide for you and He'll protect you. But they seem to forget that all those rules went out the window the week before the Lord's death. <laughs> While the Lord was in the world, they would be protected. They would lack nothing. Now that the Lord will not be in the world, they're going to need some swords. <laughs> they're going to need to be ready to protect themselves. And, there, and in this, you know, it is possible God's rescinded a command or things have changed. It's possible to, you know, obey an old commandment and still be in a, in a state of disobedience. Because things have changed. This is the very, it's a, it is a, a wonderful illustrate, dispensational illustration for all of us. Context, rightly dividing the word of truth. Things change. Now flip back over to John 14. John 14. Uh, look at verse 1. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, there's a lot to be said about this verse. How do you exegete this verse? What did he mean when he said, in my Father's house are many mansions? And I found it interesting. I did a little digging around. A lot of commentaries just openly speculate here. Well, he's probably talking about heaven, you know, lots of mansions in heaven. Well, consider this. Every time the Lord had ever said, my father's house, he was talking about the temple. When he first flipped over the tables in the temple in John 2, he said, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So when the Lord says in my father's house are many mansions, Baker and others would suggest that this might be a reference to the millennial temple where Christ would reign, which would also be considered his father's house. And I'm inclined to agree. That makes a lot of sense to me. I'm, although I'm open to the thing, other things that others would say, but 
We already know from our old end of the world series that the Mount Zion is massive. The temple is going to be massive. This massive complex that's going to include a lot of glorious mansions. And the implication here is that some of those mansions will be their mansions because of their positions sitting on thrones with Christ, judging those 12 tribes of Israel. Also suggested was the idea that the temple atop Mount Zion in the millennium may come down from heaven, like New Jerusalem, as a way of kind of foreshadowing the arrival of New Jerusalem. That's speculation, but those ideas seem to, seem to fit what the Lord says here. Another question. How is it that the Lord will go to prepare a place for them? Does this mean that the millennial temple and those mansions haven't been built yet, and the Lord is going to go up there and he's going to oversee their construction? No. I'd suggest that he's preparing the kingdom for them in everything he'll be doing while he's gone. He's going to take away sin through his sacrifice at Calvary. He's going to fill up those heavenly seats with the body of Christ in this age of grace, which are going to be put on display to the Father's glory all throughout the millennium. And then he's going to bring, and then he's going to bring about the establishment of his kingdom when he carries out all 21 of those judgments during the tribulation. Everything that he'll be doing while he's gone is preparation for that kingdom to come. Now look at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. I love these verses. Where the Lord is going now, they can't follow him. But in the kingdom, wherever he is, they will always be with him. And they will always know where he's going and the way to get there. I love that. Verse 5. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. And Philip, <laughs> Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. I love that line. Believe that I am because of what I say, or believe that I am because of what I do. But the question here about belief, I'm sure a lot of people would have questions about why is he constantly telling the disciples to believe? The Lord's been pleading with them to believe. Weren't they, didn't they believe? Weren't they saved? Yes, they were. Didn't they believe from the beginning? Yes. Then why is the Lord telling them to believe here? Because they're having doubts now. That's why. The Lord has, has been telling them he's going to die and he's going to go away. How can this be? Right? Now they're starting to question if he's the Messiah. How can the Messiah go away like this? This isn't supposed to happen. The kingdom's here. Look at verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. I suspect that in the tribulation, believers were going to accomplish some unbelievably amazing miracles, perhaps even greater than what the Lord's done. It might be what he's referring to. Verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, 
that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And all of this, I think, is in view of the coming kingdom, not a, yet a present reality. The rest of the chapter is talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's all pretty straightforward. How about we just go ahead and read this, and then we'll and then we'll and then we'll close uh, uh, close it. Look at uh, verse fifteen. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye, knew, ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live. Ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. <laughs> I love how he clarifies here. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it, came to come to, before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not... Talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Uh, quick word on the final line, arise, let us go hence. Uh, do they leave? What happens? In chapter 15, uh, you don't you don't see any any black letters there talking about how they changed locations or that they uh, left. But the Lord goes into that famous "I am the true vine" discourse. Now, some suggest they may have moved from one room to another, which makes no sense because the Bible says "upper room," not "upper rooms." <laughs> so many think that they actually left the upper room. And what we read in John 15, 16, and 17 is what the Lord said when they walked from the upper room all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'm inclined to agree because uh, you also find in uh, John 18, in the first verse, when Jesus had spoken these words, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook of C brook Cedron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. So John uh, actually told us after the fact that Jesus had spoken all those words while they were walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'll just leave it there. Um, anybody have any thoughts, questions, comments, anything? Yeah, 
Yeah. 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 Right. 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 Isn't that amazing? It's amazing because you get so many people today that are get saved and they don't want to do a second Timothy 2.15 says and to study. You know, yeah. And, and it's because the Holy Spirit is going to tell them to do it. <laughs> and, those, and those guys would have perfect recall. Yeah. I remember what the Lord said about this. Perfect recall. Oh, what I'd give for that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Totally jealous. Yeah. Uh, he, he actually would say more in uh, John 16 about the Spirit and the way the Spirit would operate that they would actually hear, the Spirit would tell them what He hears in heaven. And so I suspect that what was happening, is, even when Peter was preaching, is that the Spirit was telling him what to say. It was like it's a God's Bluetooth, right? His spiritual Bluetooth. And he heard the Father speaking, and Peter was reiterating what the Father was telling him through the Spirit. And, as, and, and I think that just as the Lord, the words that what the Lord spoke were the words of the Father, same with Peter at Pentecost. This was still the Father's ministry speaking through Peter. And uh, I, I, I find that amazing. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to add to that because you can go to 1 John uh, and then read in, uh, I think it's in chapter 2, where it talks about you don't need any men, another man to teach you. Yeah. I always wondered how the Holy Spirit teaches. He uh, this goes back to when the guys were filled with the Spirit back, and they were creating all the instruments for the tabernacle. Yeah. And they were in the wilderness, um, and uh, you know, is it just you just suddenly know how these things work, or does He talk to you and explain it to you? I always wondered, Sonia. Yeah, Baker made that point also. Yeah, I'll bet you money uh, the Lord, uh, Satan wanted to possess Judas a whole lot earlier uh, because he was in a continual state of unbelief. He had never gotten saved. He would. The Lord would say in uh, the high priestly prayer that all of them were saved but one. And uh, he was allowed to enter into Judas after the Lord exposed him as the betrayer. Um, I think he was able to go into it with the Lord's permission. And... Uh, the Lord just basically set in motion the inevitable. Who did? Oh, did he? Oh, awesome. Awesome. All right. How about a word of prayer? Heavenly Father. Father, just how unbelievably glorious is this final week of your son and how grateful we are for his choice to continue to go to Calvary, fulfill your will, which has brought about redemption for all of us. We are so grateful for redemption. We're so grateful for the sacrifice of your son to take on the consequence of all our sins. We're grateful for being able to get eternal life by just simply believing and trusting in that. And I pray, Father, that... Uh, all of us will just stand in awe of your word and go out and glorify your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Hey, awesome to see you. We'll be back on Friday morning. I'm, I know I've, I've got Brian Ross is going to be with us. So I'm going to invite some other guys. It should be a lot of fun. So come on back. Hey, you have a really bad night. We'll see you Friday. Bye.